Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn, and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. I haven't posted in a while. I was in the hospital, but um, I'm gonna jump right into today's story. If you wanna know the details of what was going on and why I haven't posted in three weeks, I'll give you all those details at the end of the video. But for right now, I'm just gonna jump right into today's video. Today's story is about the Canadian killer, Russell Williams. Russell Williams' crimes are not unique, but he himself is very unique. He has been extensively studied since he has been incarcerated because he just doesn't fit any of the sort of typical things you expect from a serial killer. Now, he's not actually classified as a serial killer because he only killed two people, but even he himself admitted that if he wouldn't have been stopped, he would have just kept on killing. But other than his crimes, Russell Williams lived a very successful, normal life. It's not the typical story you hear about killers. And one of the most interesting things about Russell Williams is actually his life outside of his crimes. So Russell Williams was born March 7th, 1963 in England when he was about five years old, his family immigrated and moved to Canada. His parents got divorced when he was six years old and he grew up and he had a very normal childhood. There's never been any information that's ever come out that he had a difficult childhood or he exhibited any behaviors that were concerning at all. He seemed to grow up being quite normal. And he manages to keep up this facade of a normal life right up until he's actually captured. His family, when they had moved to Canada, when he was about five years old, they moved to Scarborough, which is an area in Toronto. Russell Williams would finish elementary school, go through high school, and eventually he would end up going to U of T University of Toronto, the Scarborough campus. Now this is the very first time something interesting happens in this story. Well, Russell Williams was attending the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, a very famous Canadian serial killer was also attending the same campus. Russell Williams and Paul Bernardo attended the same campus at the same time. Paul Bernardo was one year behind, but the two of them at the exact same time were attending the same school and the same campus. There has never been anything suggesting that the two of them ever knew each other. No one has ever claimed that they knew each other. Neither of them have ever said they knew each other. Um, it's just, it's really interesting because their crimes are so similar. They're very, very similar people. Russell Williams ends up graduating with a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Toronto. And while there has been a lot of people who have studied Russell Williams, because he just doesn't fit any of the typical things that people expect. The only thing that ever seemed to come up that people found weird was when he was attending university, he would play really elaborate pranks on his friends and his roommates. It was said that he was very good at picking locks, which he uses quite extensively in his crimes many, many, many years later. He would play these pranks where he would hide in closets or cupboards for um, roommates and then he would wait for the roommate to come home and then when the roommate would come home or the roommate would go into their bedroom, he would jump out and scare them, which isn't strange at all. Lots of people 
pull pranks like that, especially, you know, when you're in uh, college and, you know, having a good time. The thing that made it really strange about Russell Williams was he would sit and wait in the closet for hours. So he would be willing to sit in a closet for three or four hours, just completely silent in the closet alone, just so he could jump out to scare someone. And that really, of everything in his life, was the only thing that people could ever really come up with that they found strange about him. In 1987, Russell Williams joined the Canadian forces. Williams was highly respected, very highly regarded. He moved up very quickly. He ended up becoming a pilot and was part of the Air Force and he was extremely successful. He eventually becomes a colonel and he actually becomes the head of Trenton Air Base. On July 15th, 2009, Russell Williams is sworn in as wing commander of the Canadian Air Force Base Trenton. The Canadian Forces Base in Trenton is the largest and busiest Air Force Base in Canada. If you're in the Canadian military and you're leaving the country, you fly out of Trenton. If you are outside of the country in the military and you are returning to Canada, you fly into Trenton. Russell Williams, he was basically the person in charge of the entire Air Force Base in Trenton. He was so successful in the military. He would fly the Prime Minister of Canada. He would fly the Secretary of State. If there were any dignitaries that would come to Canada and visit from other countries, there's a million pictures of him. The Queen came to visit Canada and he was the Queen's personal pilot. So he was very, very high up, very high regarded and very much respected. So when he took over this airbase, it was a huge honor for him. Russell Williams was married. He had a seemingly happy marriage from everything that we can tell. Him and his wife, they owned a home in Ottawa. They also owned a home in Tweed, Ontario. The wife primarily lived in the home in Ottawa because that's where her job is located. And they also had, it was a kind of like a cottage house in Tweed, which was closer to the Trenton Air Base where Russell would stay. So during the week, he would be in Tweed, she'd be in Ottawa. And then supposedly on the weekends, usually one would go to the other and they would spend time together, I guess. As I had mentioned, July 15th, 2009 is when he was sworn in as the commander of the Trenton Air Base. But we're gonna go back four days before he was sworn in. July 11th, 2009 is four days earlier. Russell Williams, it is after midnight. He is standing naked in the backyard of one of his neighbors peering into the home, watching the woman inside who was alone. The woman then went into the shower. When Russell noticed her go into the shower, he broke into her home naked, went into her bedroom, stole underwear, and fled the home. What no one knew about Russell Williams at this time was he was a very sick sexual predator. When Russell fled the home, the woman had no idea that he had been in her home. He was standing naked in the backyard and this is where he will later, once he gets caught, say that he made the decision that he wanted to increase the risk of what he was doing. He wanted more of a thrill and he wanted to start doing things that were much more likely that he could get caught. And once he becomes commander of the airbase, his crimes definitely escalate. But first, we're gonna talk about what has this guy been doing so far? Two years earlier, Russell had started breaking into the homes of women and teen girls that he had been stalking. 
When Russell Lim started breaking into homes, he had stalked the girls whose homes he would break into. They were usually preteen girls, and he would a lot of times break into their homes. He would try on their underwear. He would take pictures of himself wearing their underwear. He would perform sexual acts on himself laying in their bed or standing, you know, around their things. And then he would steal underwear and leave the home. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of his victims didn't even know that they were his victims until he ended up getting caught. Because one thing about Russell Williams is he's extremely meticulous and he catalogs every single crime, exactly what he did. And he also take, would take pictures and videos. So once he was caught and all of his crimes came out, it ended up that he had broken into the homes of almost 90 different women and girls' homes. Sometimes he would go in and leave a message so that the girl or woman would know someone had been in there, but they couldn't really tell what he had done. In one case, there was a teen girl and he had broken into her home and stole her underwear and he had also gone onto her computer and wrote merci, like thank you in French, and just left that message on her computer screen and then fled. So some victims would come home and they would know that someone had been in their home because some houses he would break into, he would just steal a couple pieces of underwear or if it was a woman, he would steal lingerie. But a lot of victims, he would just take all of their underwear. So they would obviously know that someone had been in their home and was doing this. But the very, very strange thing is that he did this to all of his immediate neighbors. Like he would do this to a neighbor that was two houses down. And you would think if, if you're going to be breaking into houses and breaking into as many houses as he ended up breaking into, you think you would distance yourself a bit and be like, okay, I'm gonna go outside my neighbor. I'm not gonna go to the house next door. But he always broke into homes in his neighborhood. Now the belief of whether his wife knew what he was doing or whether she didn't is a little bit questionable. His wife was never charged and there's never been any thing from the police accusing that the wife was aware. There are victims who do believe that the wife was aware, but in my opinion, I think his wife tried really, really hard not to know what he was doing. Because the way that Russell Williams would go about this is he would go on jogs at one in the morning. He also had an office in his home in which he told his wife that she was not allowed to go into because he was a very high ranking member of the military. So he told her that he had top secret government, uh, you know, military information in this office. So he had to keep this room secure so his wife would never enter it. Now in the office, there was nothing to do with anything to do with the military. Everything he did for work was at work, but this was how he kept his wife out of this room. In this room, he had logged every single crime, exactly what he had stolen. He had pictures and pictures and pictures of him wearing all of these women's lingerie. And at one point he had almost 1500 pieces of underwear and lingerie. After he confessed, he actually told police that on several occasions, he would have to have bonfires so that he could burn the lingerie because he didn't have enough room to store the amount that he had stolen. So for the beginning of all of this, he would not actually have any interaction with the women. There were a few occasions where women would catch him 
in the home, running out of the home, but he had never actually physically touched or assaulted anyone at this point. But this, somehow there's a correlation because once he finds out he's taking over the airbase, this is the point where he decides he is going to escalate and start committing physical assaults and murders. And another part that's very strange about this is he was in his 40s before he started committing these crimes. Even breaking in and stealing the underwear and stalking these women, he didn't commit any of these crimes until he was in his 40s. And if you know anything about true crime, these friggin' sickos, they don't seem to be able to hold it together and act like, I don't know, normal human beings for five minutes. But this guy somehow was able to cover up and hide these urges that he had. So he had taken over the airbase in July 2009. In September 2009, he broke into two women's homes and R-worded them. And then in November 2009, Corporal Marie France Como, who was 37 years old and worked at the Trenton Air Base, was found dead in her home. And Marie France Como was a very bright shining star in the military. She was a flight attendant that worked at the airbase that Russell Williams worked at. And Russell Williams said that they had met one time, but that them meeting or him knowing her at the airbase wasn't connected to why he ended up killing her, which, okay, that doesn't make any sense. Like, okay, <laughs> nothing this guy does make sense, but he did end up breaking into her home and killing her. Then on January 28th, 2010, Jessica Lloyd went missing. She was a beautiful, bright 27 year old woman and she went missing from her home. Police ended up finding very distinct tire tracks along the side of her home. And these tire tracks is what would be the thing that would get Russell Williams caught. There ended up being a witness who saw what turned out to be Russell Williams in his SUV outside of Jessica Lloyd's house the night that she went missing. The witness who saw the car, he found the car was in a really strange location and he found it strange that it was there at that time of night and whatever it was in him, he really took notice of this car and found it strange. And then the next day, obviously, he heard on the news that Jessica Lloyd, who lived in that home, had gone missing. So he quickly contacted the police to report this car that he had seen. The police were very confident that if they could find the tires, they would find the person who was responsible for this. Um, I don't know much about t car tires, to be honest with you, but um, apparently these were extremely distinctive and very rare. So what the police started doing was they went on to the main highway close to where Jessica Loy lived and they canvassed and stopped every single vehicle traveling on that highway. So they would stop every vehicle, check their tires, and let them go. And while the police were out canvassing, Russell Williams pulled up and they checked his tires. As soon as they saw Russell's tires, they knew that this was the tires that they were looking for. They just let him go, but they started following him. So police were following Russell and they decided that they wanted to bring him in for an interview. They ended up going to his house in Ottawa where he was staying on the weekend. And they went up to him on a Sunday afternoon and said, you know, we'd like you to come in and ask you some questions. And the interview of Russell Williams is probably one of the most interesting interrogation 
interviews that I've ever seen. I've watched so many videos of cops interviewing suspects. In this interview, I'll link it below in the description because the police officer in this video is spectacular. He's absolutely spectacular in what he does. So in the video, Russell Williams comes in and, you know, he just seems like a really nice, normal guy. Normally when you're watching, you know, suspects being interviewed, you look at them and you're like, oh, they're creepy or they're weird or whatever. If I ended up in a room with Russell Williams, I would have just thought he was just an average person. He wouldn't have creeped me out at all. So at the point that the cop brings him in to be interviewed, they've already matched the tire tracks and they're in the middle of executing a search warrant on his two homes and they also have DNA. So Russell Williams is caught. He doesn't know it, but the cop wants a confession and he gets it. And it seems the interview, like Russell Williams thought he could just go into his interview room and just talk himself out of whatever trouble he was in. But no, 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 Mr. Freak Show, you're going down. So they talk for a while and the cop starts telling him the evidence that they have against him. And then the cop tells him that they're in the middle of a search warrant in his Ottawa home and his Tweed home. As soon as he's told that they're searching his Ottawa home, Russell Williams becomes very concerned about his wife. Russell Williams, obviously in his own mind, he knows that the police are gonna find all of this evidence. So he knows in his mind at a certain point when once he knows there's search warrants in his homes, he knows he's caught because he knows there's evidence that can prove all of these things. Russell Williams becomes very concerned about the impact that this is going to have on his wife. And he's concerned with how upset his wife is that her home is being searched right now. So the cop kind of jumps on the concern that Russell has for his wife. And at this point, Russell's quiet. He's, you can tell he knows he's caught and you can tell he's lost his confidence and he knows he has no control over what's happening. So the cop kind of almost gives him this like piece of control. Like, how do you want this to play out? How do you want to be known? The cop says to him, like, how do you want to be remembered? You don't seem like a cold hearted psychopath. And then he kind of switches it and he said, well, some people, they want to be notorious. They want the attention. They like being known as this criminal. And Russell Williams is kind of, you can see there's more. He's, he's thinking and not sure what to say. And then the cop just says to him, well, when Russell says, what do you mean? He says, Bernardo. And he's speaking about Paul Bernardo. But in Canada, if you're if you were to ask a Canadian who's the most evil Canadian, most people would say Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka. Like that would be the first person most people in Canada probably think of as the most evil Canadian. So as soon as he says Bernardo, all of a sudden in Russell Williams' mind, I'm sure he's thinking, I don't want to be thought of that way. So he just says to the cop, get me a map. And the cop goes and gets the map. And this is, um, you don't see this part uh, in the interview, but this is where he actually discloses where he had put um, Jessica Lloyd's body. So in Russell Williams' home, they eventually, they, they find all of the evidence and he had logged every single crime he had committed. Their return is out that it was 82, they call them fetish-related break-ins. And these were the break-ins where he would break in and steal their underwear, try their underwear or lingerie on, take pictures. He would perform sexual acts on himself in these girls and women's rooms, like just really gross shit. He had also R-worded two women. Uh, in Canada, if someone is R-worded, their name is protected, so it's never um, public, which I mean, I think is wonderful and sh these women should be protected. Um, and then he was charged with two murders. So he was given the maximum sentence in Canada, which is life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years.
In Canada, everyone is given the opportunity to have parole after 25 years. But in cases like this, he'll never get out of prison. He'll never get parole. But that's what the maximum sentence in Canada is, which is what he got, which is good. So after he's like sent away, the military is not liking any of what has happened. The military literally burned and cut up everything that was related to Russell Williams that he ever earned while he was in the military. When he went into prison, he, I, he did try to unalive himself, I think just once, um, but now it just kind of seems like he's kind of resigned himself to the fact that he's just going to be stuck in a cell forever. And it's he's in segregation basically for his own safety. And he will rot there until the day he dies. So if you've watched this channel before, you might have noticed that I haven't uploaded for the last three weeks. Um, I was actually in the hospital. I was quite sick for uh, quite a while and I'm still not quite better yet, but I really wanted to come back and do another video. And so we'll be back to uploading again once a week. And then once I'm finally fully recovered and feeling better, we'll go back to uploading twice a week. But as for right now, you can expect one video a week until I am back and feeling much, much better. But I really appreciate you watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to see more from me, please subscribe and I will see you in the next one.